recording and we are on in three two and one well maybe i don't have an arch nemesis because i solve all my crimes yeah man that's a pretty fucked up thing to say yeah yeah you're right welcome to another episode of nerdery and murder episode 122 big 122 i'm zig with your nerdery and I'm Jeffrey with your murdery. Welcome to another week of the ups and downs, the highs and lows, and the good and the bad, and the nerd and the murd. And we have once again in the house with us, guestery, we have Keith. Welcome again, Keith. Hello. Hey, I, I don't I don't remember if I told you that and the, and this this is cool just to me. Uh I don't remember if I told you this or not, but you know, it, I talked about that I'm golfing and everything. Uh one of the things that that you you need to have in your tool bag when you golf with other people is a, is a ball marker. So in case you're in the way of somebody else, you, you mark where your ball is so they can golf over and blah, 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 blah. I, I don't have a specific one. You can just use a coin or anything like that. But I was teeing off on nine one day and I looked down, I saw something in the grass. I wasn't really sure what it was, kind of brushed it with my club a little bit and then bent down and picked it up. And somebody had dropped and left a ball marker that was Dallas Cowboys. Nice. So that's so you now, have a ball marker now, now. That's now mine. Yes. <laughs> I hope they're not listening. <laughs> if they're listening, tough. They lost it. Yeah. And at no point did it occur to you to like take it to the lost and found or anything like that. Just you know, zero. zero. <laughs> we need to get you a, a BSG coin. That's what you need. Yeah, a little BSG coin. I'm, happy with, coin. I'm happy with my Cowboys one. So the other fun thing that's been going along, going around with us, uh, you know, we're getting a, we're getting a pool or we're, we're having a pool built in the backyard and uh, we've got the concrete down and everything. And I decided to just get in and walk around and see if it was good eye level or the height level and everything like that. And Loki was very confused that I was down in a hole. <laughs> And so now he keeps looking at it, and I think he realizes, hey, I think there's supposed to be water in this. We got about two more weeks, and it'll be done. Yay! So, just in time for, you know, the cold weather. Yes. Yeah, yeah but down there, you should be able to start swimming before any place else. Maybe? Oh, yeah, probably March. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the weather's very mild down here. We had a, we had a, we had a couple of cold cool days at least for us um earlier in the week uh or was it last week it was either last week or earlier this week uh where it was down in the 40s in the mornings and very very windy i mean that that gulf wind is bitter when it's cold i bet um so you know that that but we've been about in the 80s ever since it's been it's been really nice really nice, nice. and sunny and things like that so but yeah yeah, that's that's kind of the big things for me. Zig, you got anything? Uh, not too much. Uh, basically, getting uh, getting the kids to work and school and things of that nature. So, anything interesting going on in your life, Keith? Uh, just uh, playing with the band that I've been playing with. That's uh, a lot of fun. Um, Do still, tell. Still the symphony, or or like a no, house no, band? I. I I quit the I quit the symphony and now I'm playing with a brass band that's uh, sort of a New Orleans second line style uh, band. I'm playing sousaphone with them, and we just do you know community gigs around town. You know we're just an amateur you know band that pretty much anybody can join, and we do neighborhood parades and you know holiday music and you know we had a fun gig for a, a big neighborhood thing on Halloween and everybody dressed up in costumes and that kind of shit. You know. Oh, it's, wow. oh nice that's cool. yeah that's cool what's the band called blow commotion uh, blow commotion yes. you heard it here kids if you're down in the austin area look for blow commotion yes you know speaking of speaking of music um one thing i was very excited about last night uh i had been looking for this for a while but I, and i and i heard it was good but i didn't want to pay for it pay to rent it or anything like that but I just saw that Whiplash is now available on Netflix. And I'm really, really interested in watching that. Is that the one about roller derby with um, 
No, no which, it's the one about a symphony band. Uh, Jake J.K. Simmons is the is the director, and from all the videos I've seen, he's kind of like really, really a big asshole. <laughs> uh, J.K. Simmons, right no. on. yeah, I didn't check that out. I think Whiplash was nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, that I think sounds it sounds right. I, I think yeah. it won one. Did it? Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll look that up here uh, in in just a minute. So now, but I, I'm now I'm thinking about that. Keith is right. The name of the Derby roller derby movie was also called Whiplash, and it was great. Yeah, was, think, it, was it Whiplash or Whip It? Uh, yeah, don't look that up. But you know what? You may be right. It may be Whip It. Yeah, but that was. Uh, oh, Paul Reiser's in Whiplash too. Uh, let's see. Awards, 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 awards. Where to go? Up, up, uh, accolades. It was. Planned to complete compete in the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay, but announced it would be competing in Adapted Screenplay. Uh, J.K. Simmons did receive an award for Best Supporting Actor, and it received the award for Best Film Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and received a Grammy no uh, nomination. Oh, nice. In 2020, it ranked 14 on Empire's list of the 100 greatest movies of the 21st century. Wow. Interesting. So, yeah, I'd been interested, in it, and I just saw it, like, just, like, last night that, that Whiplash was now featured on Netflix. So, well, probably thanks for the recommendation. this week. We'll definitely yeah. checking that out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Zig, I will let you take over on the nerdery side of the house. Okie dokie. So, today, we're going to talk about... Yeah. Nerder. Nerder. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about Brooklyn Nine Nine. Never watched it. Oh my god, it's hysterical. I've I've seen clips. Uh, it's an American police procedural comedy television series that aired on Fox and later on NBC. The show aired from September seventeenth, twenty thirteen, to September sixteenth, twenty twenty one, for a total of eight seasons and one hundred and fifty three episodes. <clears throat> episodes, sorry. It was created by Dan Gore and Michael Schur. Uh, the premise revolves around seven New York City Police Department detectives who are ad adjusting to life under their new commanding officer, the serious and stern Captain Raymond Holt, played by Andre Brower. Featuring an ensemble cast headed by Brower and Andy Samberg, the cast also features Stephanie Beatrice, uh, Terry Crews, Melissa Fumero, Joe Latruglio, Chelsea Peretti, Dirk Blocker, and Joel McKinnon Miller. You said Fox and NBC. Did it not move to a streaming service at one point? Uh, okay, so originally, originally it was produced by uh, NBC Television, mm -hmm. but it didn't air on NBC. It aired on Fox. Fox canceled it, and NBC picked it up. Right. Okay, but it was never. It, no, it was, it was never it, exclusively streaming. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it has been on Hulu though its entire run. It's sure. There now. Um, most of Fox's shows are on Hulu. Yes, uh, and Peacock. I mean, we watch it a lot around here. It, it just became like a, it became like a bellwether for for our family because the character that Joe Latrulio plays, uh, Boyle. Everybody looked at me and went, "You're, you're like Boyle. You, you like you overshare. Um, you, <laughs> you're really obsessed with weird things like food or other things." And I was like, "Oh man, that's just mean." And I watched it. and I was like, "Uh, you're right." Does he ruin? Does he ruin movies for people like you do? Yes, yes, he does. <laughs> and he, uh, uh, and, and again, he overshares, and is obsessed with unusual things. Like uh, his family has this, what they call the, uh, the mother dough, which they have a sourdough recipe that that's in this one jar that's been around their family for like over a hundred years, and. He's obsessed about by it. I, I, so yeah, that's how I got onto it because I, I wasn't that interested in it. First, I, I watched the first episode. And I was like, "Well, Andre Brower is pretty good," but uh, no. and it was a couple of years. And uh, my, my wife Cree's like, uh, "You're Boyle. You need to watch this." So I started watching it. I was like, "Oh my god, this is hysterical!" But it's because it's a it's an ensemble show. Plot really doesn't get in the way of it. It it's it's mostly uh, character. Um, 
uh, character interplay. That's what the show's about. And is it, I like is that. It's kind of like The Office where, where they go into every scene with just sort of an outline and uh, and then, and they're pretty much just like making up dialogue on the fly. Yes, yes, and no. They do have they they have more dialogue written down beforehand because uh, Dan Gore and Michael Schur are really good joke writers. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of of ad libbing, and they'll shoot it a couple of different ways. Or they were shooting it a couple of different ways. Uh, Stephanie Beatrice. <laughs> Her voice is actually very high, but she had been doing um, she'd been doing a gig where she was uh, basically a, a dance coach uh, for for an, uh, not a dance I'm sorry aerobics teacher. So she'd been screaming at people all day, you know, at the top of her lungs. Come on, let's do it. So when she auditioned, her voice was really really deep and husky. They loved it so much that she had to continue doing that voice. And what's funny is when you watch the episodes, you can tell when Stephanie Beatrice, homegirl, by the way, from San Antonio, (laughs) gets cracked up because her voice goes up about three octaves. (laughs) That's her natural speaking voice, the high voice, not the low voice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really funny. Uh, Terry Crews plays a character called Terry Jeffords. He refers to himself in the third person through the whole series. Uh, Terry lacks yogurt. Terry has to eat. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, uh, again, Joe LaTrulio with the oversharing and stuff. A lot of these guys were um, not just actors, but a lot of them were associated with uh, the state like and uh, Upright Citizens Brigade, like Joe LaTrulio, uh, Chelsea Peretti, um, Dirk Blocker and Joe McKinnon Miller, who were Featured and eventually became full-time cast members. Uh, Aless- Melissa Fumero uh, is pretty much the only straight-up actor. Uh, all the rest of these people are comedians, uh, either working with, again, Second City, uh, the Groundlings, or uh, the Upright Citizens Brigade. Dirk Blocker's the son of Dan Blocker, isn't he? Uh, I believe yes, so. Yes, 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 he is. He looks like Dan Blocker. Yeah, from Bonanza. Um, Joel McKinnon Miller is also an opera singer, uh, and they bring that out all the time. He plays this disgusting old detective, and he just busts out with this beautiful <laughs> operatic singing <laughs> for no reason. Um, but it was originally produced as a single camera comedy. Uh, Fox originally ordered 13 episodes for its first season, eventually expanding it to 22 episodes. Brooklyn Nine-Nine premiered on September 17th, 2013, on, and on May 10th, 2018 – Fox canceled the series after five seasons, and the very next day, NBC picked it up for a sixth season, and they went on to produce six, seven, and eight seasons. Uh, the ten-episode eighth and final season premiered on August 12, 2021. The series has been acclaimed by critics. Uh, the first season won the Golden Globe Award for Best Television Series, Musical, or Comedy. And on the same night, Sandberg won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor, Television Series, Musical, or Comedy. Brower has been nominated four times for Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series and has twice won the Critics' Choice Television Awards for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. The series has also received particular praise for its portrayal of serious issues while retaining a sense of humor. For its portrayal of the LGBTQ plus people, the series won the 2018 GLAAD Media Awards for Outstanding Comedy Series. Uh, writers and producers Michael Shore and Dan Gower, are, uh, who had known each other since they were students at Harvard University and had collaborated on the sitcoms Park and, Parks and Recreation, conceived the idea to a, set a comedy in a police station, a setting they felt had been insufficiently used in television comedies since Barney Miller. They pitched the idea to produce uh, the company for Universal Television, where Schur had a development deal. And although Universal signed on to produce the series, its parent company, Network NBC, passed on airing it, and this is why it went to Fox. Um, It did pretty well its first four or five seasons. And then again, you know, Fox, if, if if your series drops below a threshold, they just cancel you. They don't give you a second to to spin out of it or get out of a storyline or Fox just completely fucks you like Firefly. <clears throat> yeah. 
yeah, I, I wouldn't want to put my show on Fox. But like I said, NBC, who was already producing, it's like, yeah, yeah no, we'll, we'll run it. And and the ratings went up uh, after it moved to NBC. So They were probably kicking themselves that they passed on it originally. And when the opportunity came by, came came around to get it back, they just jumped right on it. Yeah, jumped right on it. Well, I mean, you know, and they were already <laughs> they were already producing it, so it's yeah. not like they were going to lose that much money. Um, now, the exterior view of the fictional 99th Precinct building was the actual 78th Precinct building in Brooklyn. Uh, if the 99th Precinct were real, it would be considered a Brooklyn police precinct, where numbers can theoretically range from 60 to 99. But no precinct has yet been assigned number 99, which remains reserved for future use. So they did some research on it. I thought that was nice. <clears throat> like if if there was a 99th precinct, it would be in Brooklyn. So Brooklyn 99 would be correct. But they don't have a 99 yet. And they and now they probably won't. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> Brooklyn 99. Um, so yeah, I mean – the thing about this series mostly, uh, it's really funny. There's a bunch of inside jokes. Andre Brower plays this straight-laced, very serious super cop um, who is who is married to a a a professor of history. Um, he's very out and proud. However. He also speaks in a monotone most of the time, and 90% of the humor is Andre Brower talking like this. Really, really funny. I know it doesn't seem it, but it seems like there are times when the cast is trying to make him crack a smile, and you can tell that's what they're doing, and they go – they'll just spin off from there. And when you catch him smiling, you're just like, okay, yeah, they got him there. Uh. Andy Samberg, of course, is crazy and insane, and and I love him. But it's not it's not so much about him. He was it was a it was supposed to be a starring vehicle for him. But when they started putting it together, it's like no, no, this needs to be an ensemble cast. This needs to be a collection of weirdos working in the New York City Police Department. Andy Samberg, to me, honestly seems seems like he wants to be that that he's a wannabe Ryan Reynolds. I could see that. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. And he bothers me at times. I just that 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 quirkiness. I think he. I think I think he's trying too hard. Um, I would say in the first episode or two, you could probably state that case for the series as well. That's that's not that's not unfounded. Uh, but once you get into the series, especially once you start going down the avenues of Rosa, uh, who is played by Stephanie Beatrice, and uh, Boyle, who's played by Joe Latrulio, and of course the captain, played by Andre Brower. Uh, Chelsea Peretti, uh, who left the series after, I want to say, six or seven seasons. She comes back, but the reason Chelsea Peretti left is uh, she and her husband Jordan Peele – are running a very successful production company sure. and she had to kind of pull back and do some work on that because I think at the time they were they were either in post production um of get out or they were about to release it as well as doing uh the Twilight Zone series that they did on CBS mm-hmm. so yeah she was like ah you know I got to step back but she did come back and do a couple of episodes in each subsequent season in 7 and 8 Twilight Zone on CBS didn't last, did it? Uh, no, I think it did two, maybe three seasons. Okay. Um, and just like the last revival of the Twilight Zone in the early two thousands. Uh, CBS with Porsche is Whitaker. a streamer is Paramount, right? Yes. I'll have to look for it there because uh, this is the first time hearing that there. Oh was my god! Not only did they oh, do, yeah. not oh, only yeah. did they do episodes, you can also watch them in black and white. Oh, um, nice! And Jordan Peele is the rod serling character yeah 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 no no, you should check it out um and 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 basically they will start to tell a a a well-loved twilight zone series uh like uh terror at thirty thousand feet and turn it on its ear and then it'll spin around it'll yeah cool oh yeah yeah oh dude it's nuts 
Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, you should check that out. It's really good. But again, she was uh, so Chelsea Peretti was working on that, so the the character of Gina basically leaves. But again, she comes back for some other a couple some shenanigans. She's there for the last episode, um, which they decided because of of all of the things going down with the with policing at the time that they decided to basically tackle that subject head on in the last few seasons. So there's some really there's some seriousness involved in it and in season 6, 7 and 8 you get more of that which to me makes it feel a little more like Barney Miller because Barney Miller was very serious when it needed to be serious. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Barney Miller was also hysterically funny. Right. Because of that was was Barney Miller a, a Norman Mailer show? Like All in the Family and a couple of others? No. No. Because that was those were the groundbreaking sitcoms of the 70s yes. that were not afraid to just run face straight face on into you know problems of society of the day. And so that's that's what that reminds me of when you, yeah. when you say that. No, yeah. it, it was it, it was not. It was it was created by Danny Arnold and Theodore Flicker, Flicker, Flicker. and Noam Pitkin. Barney Miller was, uh, but it was not. Uh, it was not produced by the the All in the Family grab bag, as it were. I mean, they produced a bunch of series, uh, but this was not one of them. Or Barney Miller was not one of them. But it was in that same vein. It was like, okay, we need to do something really funny. But since it's a police, uh, a police precinct. Uh, that's constantly being underfunded. We need to talk about that, and they did, and it got serious. Brooklyn Nine Nine does that too, um, not as serious. Like none of the characters die, which is not the case in Barney Miller. Uh, we several of the characters died in Barney Miller. Oh, I say several. I, I know of at least two. Right. Um, one because the actor wanted to leave, and one because the actor actually died. Uh, nothing that serious, but yeah, Brooklyn Nine Nine kind of, kind of threads that needle pretty well in season six, seven, and eight. Um, and again, it's it's hysterical. I would recommend it to anybody. You should go check it out. Maybe skip the first two episodes. Go with episode three on. Um, really, really funny. Good weird character studies, which is what you want in you know in a procedural, because it kind of it takes that police procedural idea and it kind of turns it on its ear a little bit, which mm -hmm. is what I liked about Barney Miller and is what I like about Brooklyn Nine Nine. And of course, there are episodes where not necessarily the pot brownie episode of Barney Miller, but the same sort of thing happens all the time in Brooklyn Nine Nine. And each episode opens with a cold opening, just like our stabs. Sometimes it's related to the story that's coming up. Sometimes it's completely opposite. And, and some of those cold openings are are laugh out loud funny. In the case of you have to pause the show so you can catch what's coming up. Oh, how well. Because you may be laughing too hard. Hmm. But yeah, that basically that's about it for Brooklyn Nine Nine. I, there's not much to it other than get out and check it out. I've added a bunch of episodes and a bunch of shorts and things to our YouTube playlist so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, particularly with Ander Brower and Terry Crews, um, Stephanie Beatrice, Melissa Fumero, Joe Latrillo. Just a really funny ensemble cast. Like I said, clips from time to time have appeared in my in my Facebook feeds, and so I've seen clips but i've never actually watched watched an episode oh yeah you should check it out like i said andy samberg does feel like he was trying a little hard in the first couple episodes i'll give you that but after that he kind of settles in and realizes i think oh this isn't my show this is our show and joe latrulio and dirt blocker to a lesser extent can just steal a whole freaking scene just mm -hmm. Just doing what they're doing, doing what the, what's written, and just take it over. And it's it's brilliant and funny and weird at the same time. 
Interesting. Yeah, and if you like Barney Miller, you're going to love this because it's the same sort of show. Well, and and I was just about to say with Keith bringing up the Norman Mailer and and, and we talk about Barney Miller and whatnot. Uh, here here's an idea for you for an episode. Um, top five or top ten comedies from the seventies. Comedy okay. comedy TV shows. Yeah, I think that would be interesting if we if we covered those. Sounds like a plan. Here's a speaking of you know that that family of shows. Um, I believe that Maud was a spinoff. Yes. Of- uh, all, all, know, the all, in the, all in the family. Yeah, I thought so. So, did you know that in the seventies there was an episode of Maud where she got an abortion? Yes. And yep. it's like, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of, I, one of I just, I just learned that recently. Oh yeah. And I'm like, of, it was highly yeah. controversial. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no doubt. You think? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In one B. Arthur the Emmy, I do believe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then and then Good Times was a spinoff of Maud. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yep. oh, man, yeah. and uh, the Jeffersons was also a spinoff of one of them. Was all, it? all in the family? All in the family? Yeah. So yeah, there was like a whole ecosystem. It was the it was the Mailer Television Universe. That's yeah. right. You had you oh, had the bunker. all of the family. You had yeah. the Jeffersons. You had Maude. You had Good Times. You had Gloria. You <laughs> you had uh, uh, Florence. Which was a spinoff and only lasted like three episodes. Really funny though. Archie's place. Archie's play. Archie Bunker's place. Yep. And there's one more that I'm missing. I, I thought Gloria was hysterical, but it didn't last. But like I think a season. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Well, awesome. Thanks for another trip to with another TV series. Very much appreciate that. Nine nine. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll step over to the murdery side of the house. Murder. Uh, for today, I got my information off all that's interesting. Wikipedia, the U.S. Sun, and Ranker. And this is the story of Joseph Metheny. Joseph Metheny. Gore warning ahead. Oh, no. Uh, the police only connected him to three murderers, but jo- Joseph Roy Metheny claimed to have had slaughtered a total of 13 victims some of whom he allegedly turned into patties that he sold to unwitting customers on the Baltimore roadside. Oh, no. He made people into hamburgers? Uh Uh-huh. Yep. In 1996, Joe Metheny made headlines when he was charged for multiple murders and admitted to cooking his victim's flesh, earning earning him the nickname The Cannibal. Uh, when the police arrested Joe for assault in December of 96, they expected him to put up a fight. The six foot one, 450 pound lumber worker had apparently had a tendency to fly off the handle. And at the very least, they expected some resistance. But what they didn't expect to hear was a detail in the upfront confession, the brutality of which shocked police, especially when Methany added, quote, I'm a very sick person. Oh. In his confession, Metheny described to police how he viciously raped, murdered, and dismembered sex workers and people who were homeless. However, these victims just served as a substitute for his one intended victim, his runaway girlfriend. Then Metheny confessed to his most disturbing crimes that not only did he eat some of the victim's flesh himself, but he served it to other unknowing people as well. Uh, Joe Metheny had always been rough. He was born on March 2nd, 1954 in Baltimore, Maryland, where he ultimately lived most of his life. He endured a childhood of neglect with an absent alcoholic father and a mother forced to work extra shifts to support her six children. They lived in Essex near Baltimore, and his father was killed in a car accident when Metheny was six and he suffered depression. Uh, Joe Metheny said that his parents often sent him to live with other families in foster-like arrangements. Uh, Methany, Methany often claimed that his mother was dead. He said that they were somewhat poor and she had to work hard as a waitress, barmaid, and food truck driver, but she had provided her children with a normal family life and the children had never gone hungry or been put into homes of other families that Methany had claimed. His mother did say that Methany was an above-average student, always polite, not mean as a child. She said that, quote, he was smart and had a good childhood. If he was neglected, it was his own fault. He had a pretty good home. Uh, Not many details are known about his younger years, but his mother says he joined the Army in 1973 when he was 19. She said that he had served in Germany, 
although he claimed that he had served a tour in Vietnam and had become addicted to heroin while in, the, in an artillery unit there. His mother said she had no recollection of him serving in Vietnam, and the circumstances of his service were reported as unverified in press reports, uh, because at the time that he would have been there, American involvement in Vietnam had already ended. Uh, Metheny seldom contacted his mother after he joined the Army. She said he just kept drifting further and further away. I think the worst thing that ever happened to him was drugs. It's a sad, sad story. Once he left the Army, uh, Joe worked blue-collar jobs in lumber yards and as a truck driver. But it's hard to tell fact from fiction in his confession. Some news reports stated his first killing took place in 1994, while he claimed his killing spree actually started in 1976. Furthermore, the number of victims he admitted to killing fluctuated over the years. For instance, he claimed in 1995 he murdered five people within the span of seven hours, but a lack of evidence led to confusion as to whether or not uh, Metheny did commit all those murders in such a short time span. In 1994, Joe was living with his girlfriend and their six-year-old son in South Baltimore. Joe was ironically known as Tiny in the 90s, Again, he, is, he was six foot one, large framed, and he weighed 450 pounds. He had been spending time in bars, living with bands of homeless men in makeshift camps in South Baltimore, and spending nearly all of his money on crack cocaine, heroin, and liquor. And with his job as a truck driver, he was on the road for long stints at a time. Joe murdered Kathy Ann Magaziner in 1994, who was a 39 year old woman, and buried her body in a shallow grave on the site of the factory where he worked. Kathy Ann was a sex worker in South Baltimore who reportedly had a drug addiction, and her body, her body remained there for more than two years. He later said he had strangled her and that he had dug up her skeleton six months later, put her head in a box, and threw it in the trash. <laughs> he also later led police to the shallow grave where he had reburied Kathy Ann's decapitated remains. Much of the skull was missing, but police were able to identify her from dental records. One day, he came home to find his girlfriend gone along with their child. Like Joe, she had had a drug addiction, and Joe believed she had left with another man and took to living on the streets with him, so he flew into a rage. He spent days looking for him, checking halfway houses and even under a certain bridge where he knew his wife used to buy and do drugs. But under the bridge, he found not his wife, but two homeless men who he believed knew her. When they gave no indication that he knew where his family was, he killed them both with an axe that he had brought along. Immediately after, Metheny allegedly noticed a fisherman nearby who could have seen what he's done, and just in case he had, Joe killed him too. Uh, some people deem these first three killings crimes of passion, though he'd later develop a taste for murder. As soon as he realized what he was done, Metheny panicked and tossed the bodies into the river to hide the evidence. He did get some closure on his son's whereabouts, saying, quote, I found out about six months later she had moved on the other side of town with some asshole that had her out selling, out selling her ass for drugs. They got busted for drugs, and they took my son away from them to, to, for neglect and child abuse. Police did arrest Joe for the murder of the two men under the bridge, and he spent a year and a half in county jail awaiting trial. However, he was acquitted of any charges as he dumped their body in the nearby river and investigators couldn't find them. Without physical evidence tying him to the crimes, Joe went free and he resumed his original quest of seeking out his missing wife and child, but this time something was different. While he had spent a year and a half awaiting trial, jail time had clearly done nothing to slow him down. Shortly after being released, Joe murdered two sex workers when they failed to provide him with information on his missing girlfriend. This time, however, he had a better idea for disposing of the bodies. Instead of tossing them in the river, Joe brought the bodies home. It was there he dismembered them and stored the meatiest parts in, of them in Tupperware containers. And what didn't fit in his freezer, he buried in a truck lot owned by the pallet company he worked for. So it really seemed he was now murdering people for sport as much as revenge. And over the next several weekends, he mixed the sex workers' flesh with beef and pork, forming them in the meat little, neat little patties. He would sell these meat patties out of a small barbecue stand he opened on the side of the road, and during this time his customers would all consume bits of human flesh. They became the unwitting hiding spots for the bodies of Joe's victims. Oh, God, he's Sweeney Todd, Baltimore. Uh -huh. Yup. Okay. Whenever he needed more, quote, special meat, 
Joe would simply venture out and find another sex worker or a vagabond. And he later told police that he see, received no complaints on the meat tasting funny. In fact, well, okay, presumably the meat would only taste funny if he killed a clown. That's what I was, yeah, uh, you do it. I was gonna say, yeah, he didn't kill any clowns, clearly. Sorry, <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, it was, in fact, no one seemed to notice that his burgers had a little something extra in them. He said, quote, the human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. So the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Wow. Uh, when Joe killed 23-year-old Kimberly Spicer in November of 96, she had been making a living as a sex worker in South Baltimore. Joe was driving a forklift for a company that made wooden pallets and was living in a small trailer located near his employer. One night, Joe brought Spicer to his trailer where he killed her, dismembered her, and discarded parts of her under some wooden pallets at his work. Her mother later said she, quote, had her problems, but she was always a battler, always struggling with her problems and hoping to turn the corner. Joe Metheny was finally caught in 1996 when a would-be victim named Rita Kemper managed to escape his clutches and ran straight to the police. Rita was a sex worker in South Baltimore who Joe had kidnapped and took back to his trailer on December 8, 1996. Rita stated that Joe said he was going to kill her and bury her with his other victims, but fortunately uh, Rita escaped and went to the police for help. A week after her escape, Joe called a friend and asked for help hiding Kimberly Spicer's body. The friend immediately called the police, and they arrested Joe on December 15, 1996. As I'd stated earlier, during his interrogation, Joe willingly offered up, up his confession. He gave details about each, each of his murders, even mentioning the murder of the fishermen from several years before that they still hadn't solved. According to his confession, he killed 10 people, and authorities say there's no reason to believe he would have stopped had they not captured him. Police say that he had chosen white, uh, young white sex workers who were addicted to heroin and cocaine, and the killings also involved brutal sexual assaults. During his confession, Joe said he enjoyed killing and wouldn't apologize to his victim's family because the apology would be a lie. He went on to explain that God knew all about what he did and he was quite happy to be judged by him as well as an actual judge in a court of law. He said at the time, quote, my murder rampage started out as revenge, but ended up as a passion for the taste of blood and the overwhelming sense of power one gets for ta taking the life of another. He was indicted for killing Tony Lynn and Gracia, who was age 28, but later those charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. He claimed to have also killed three other prostitutes along Washington Boulevard in Baltimore, although no evidence, uh, there was no evidence of most of those crimes other than his confession. Eventually, a jury did find him guilty and sentenced him to death. However, a judge overturned this verdict in 2000 and changed it to two consecutive life sentences. The judge said at the trial, quote, the words I'm sorry will never come out for they would be a lie. I'm sorry, Metheny said, the words I'm sorry will never come out for they would be a lie. I am more than willing to give up my life for what I have done to have God judge me and send me to hell for eternity. I just enjoyed it. The only thing I feel bad about in any of this is that I didn't get to murder the two motherfuckers I was really after, and that's my ex-old lady and the bastards she got hooked up with. At his sentencing, he also claimed to have committed murders because he, quote, enjoyed it and got a rush out of it and got a high out of it and had no real excuse why other than, why other than I like to do it. And in 2017, guards found Joe unresponsive in his cell at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland about 3 p.m. They pronounced him dead shortly afterwards, thus ending his horrifying saga. And while authorities conducted a standard investigation into his death, they presumably didn't suspect or uncover foul play. And Metheny was 62 years old at the time of his death. And that is the horrific story of Joe Metheny. Wow. Can I just say that, you know, some friend that guy had because, you know, he asked a friend to help him bury a body and that guy went and, you know, immediately ratted him out. I just want you guys to know, and, you know, I'm, I'm saying it, you know, right here for everybody to know, if you guys ever need to bury a body, you can call me and I'll come help you out. <laughs> that's the kind of friends we are, bro. <laughs> and that's recorded for posterity if he ever, ever has to make a confession. That's, that's right. right. 
That's awesome. Well, take, thanks for taking that journey with me, Keith. We appreciate you coming West on again. Side you, forever, baby. <laughs> you are welcome on anytime you want. Um, we've got lots of good stuff that 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 we've got coming up uh, that are going to be interesting. I'm most interested uh, right now in uh, uh, the hairband episode we're going to be doing. I'm very interested in that one. Twenty six and twenty seven. Yep. Uh, we do have some other musical uh, episodes coming up. Uh, 123 is our top five, what we think of as our top five comedies. Uh, 124 is three albums by the Dead Milkmen. Uh, and uh, and uh, our exclusive number 15 is going to be New Jack City. So you actually have two playlists to listen to before we get on that. Sorry. Right. Yeah, that'll be cool. So anytime you want to join, just let us know. Definitely let you know what our recording schedule is. You can you can just pop on anytime you want. Yeah. Uh, that'll take us to awesome. the end of, of another recording week. Uh, as always, you can find us on nerderymurdery.com. That's the hub, our website, where you can find more information about us, find links to the things we talk about, as well as pictures of the stuff we talk about. Plus, you can find the link to our uh, our YouTube that Zig very, very often updates. Yes, I like to. We like to put out an episode or a, a playlist for every single episode. And this video eventually will be part of said episode when it airs, or, or said playlist when it airs. Awesome, appreciate it. all the work you do on that. Uh, you can also find the link to our merchandise. Where if you wish, wish to show off your nerdery murdery fandom, please do consider purchasing something there. And you can also find the link to our Patreon, where if you wish to become a donor to the show. Help us with the cost of keep us on the air. Uh, the 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 stuff from the merchandise and the and our patrons definitely do not go to our luxurious cars, our luxurious vacations, and our luxurious homes that we don't own. Don't own or don't take. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. And last but not least, please don't leave, forget to leave a five star review wherever you can. It really helps us and helps others find our content that may be looking for the stuff that we're talking about. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery, and I'm Jeffrey with your murdery. Keep the music.